I first of all want to thank Alma Gildenhorn and Joe. Alma is in our front row, who of course supports this wonderful series of book discussions. This is our last spring fling, I think, Alma. But we begin again and hope to see many of you back in the fall. I think our first fall engagement like this will be September 16th with uh, Kwame Anthony Apaya, the philosopher who's written a wonderful book, very Aspen-like, about uh, the origins of morality and the concept of, of of uh, uh, honor. Um, our our uh, presentation today, we have two people who need absolutely no introduction, certainly in this town, uh, probably anywhere. Uh, uh, Evan Thomas is going to uh, uh, introduce Jonathan uh, and engage in a conversation about his wonderful new book. Uh, we are also going to provide access afterwards to not only his book, but Evan's most recent book. Evan, I think it's your sixth book, seventh book, I'm not sure, but he's now writing a new book, he tells me, about, about Eisenhower uh, that we hope to bring you back to talk about. Uh, and also, what we really ought to have is a lot of Newsweeks out there, or that you should actually go buy as many as you can. Actually, our conversation in the back room was to see if any of you might be billionaires interested right. in purchasing a magazine. Actually, uh, three, three, four, <laughs> six thousand. Yeah, yeah right. actually, ask for Bradley. Maybe actually, I think we'll have to do the same solicitation in our other zip code in Aspen, where we may have a few more, a few more uh, people who uh, uh, qualify for the purchase. Uh, in any event, uh, we're delighted to have both of you here today, and Evan, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elliot. It's uh, great to be back here, uh, especially with John. Uh, like all of you, uh, I've read a lot about Obama. I've certainly heard a lot on all the endless talk shows, uh, and I've read, you know, we've read about him in good places in newspapers and magazines and our own magazine, but when I was reading this, I went, whoa, I... I, there's a depth here and a level of detail and insight that you just will not find uh, anywhere else, which is remarkable when you think about how many trees we've killed uh, uh, talking about, uh, writing about Obama. But there, there's a, his chapters on presidential temperament are the best I've ever read. Uh, and, and, and he just, he, and he, you know, John says, well, we talk about the first, you know, the famous line, the first draft of history, this is the second draft. I, I, it's more than that. Uh, the, nobody's going to be able to write a uh, book about Obama in the future without using this as a as a as a primary text. Nice. So uh, let's let's talk about him a little bit. I mean, the obvious. Uh, oh, oh, he also, I should say, John, being a good reporter, loves the telling detail. And one of the telling details he learned is that Rahm Emanuel refers to the policy shop on the second floor of the White House, the Economic Council, and the what do they call it, the Domestic Policy Council, as the Aspen Institute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, um, I guess let's do a little current events here. Uh, is, is there anything that Obama can get that's good out of the oil crisis, like maybe a carbon tax? I mean, can, is there any way he can turn this as, you know, Rahm's always talking about a crisis is too good to waste. Is there any way we can get anything good out of this, that he can get anything good out of it? Uh, I think yes, but before I answer the question, um, I want to, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a politician, but I want to thank Elliot and thank the Aspen Institute and thank you, because Evan is famous at Newsweek as not being a bullshit artist. So when he says something, and he often tells, you kind of pride yourself on telling like hard truths, like this story is no good, you know, he'll sometimes <laughs> say. And so if he had really hated the book, he wouldn't have said that. Yeah, so I'm, I, great, I'm grateful to you. I, I mean it. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge just a couple of people in the audience. Senator Harris Wofford is here, who's uh, one of my heroes and Ben Bradley who's one of my other heroes and um, so it's just nice. Two heroes in the front row, it's yeah. pretty intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and actually before I answer your question I just want to say something about uh, Harris because um, I was reminded of this uh, recently when Harris and I were talking about Selma and Harris was at Selma with Martin Luther King and he started telling this wonderful story uh, uh, about you know the details because the details are always different than what we have in our rosy imagination or, and it just reminded me that at the time he was at Selma he didn't know it was history you know that was going on maybe at a certain point he did but 
history is happening right now in Washington. And this is big stuff. This is, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, and it became a title of Doris Kearns Goodwin's book about Roosevelt, you know, it's no ordinary time that we're living in. And so you know, part of what motivated me was just this sense that I wanted to uh, do what Evan does so well in his history books and try to, try to write about it as if it was history on the fly, I guess. Um, in answer to your question, uh, as Rahm Emanuel said, out of crisis can come opportunity. Um, so far, he, you know, he doesn't seem to be turning it to his advantage, but he knows that he will be judged, at least in part, by the public on how he rises to the occasion. I don't think he can make it into something that helps him until they get the damn hole plugged, as he said. And then at that point, when um, his, uh, his stature is not seeping out of the well the way it is along with the oil right now, at that point, if he is a true commander in chief of the, uh, of the recovery, then um, he can get political points for that. One of the fascinating themes, I want to come back to the carbon tax, but one of the fascinating themes that I didn't wo that woven through all this is, is Obama as whether he has the ability to inspire. And there's so many levels to this. But I want to talk about this <clears throat> because he's getting hit right now for not being empathetic enough and being too remote and too detached. And this is an issue that comes up in your book. Talk a little bit about that in general terms, in this case specifically with the oil, but also about his coolness and his detachment mm -hmm. generally. Well, um, I think the BP oil spill is a good metaphor for his whole presidency because uh, it's not a, it, it's, uh, it was part of another one of the messes that was left for him. This was the historic hand he was dealt, was to clean up Bush's messes. You know, Don Regan, who was Ronald Reagan's chief of staff, called it the shovel brigade. You gotta clean up, you know, the, dung that the elephants leave when they leave the circus. And, and so whether it's the Wall Street bailouts, the auto crisis, you know, the Afghanistan uh, challenge where uh, the situation was much worse than he anticipated when he took office, uh, or this, it's a mess that he has to clean up. And in some ways that really irritates him and throws him off his game because that's not what he wanted to be doing with his presidency. It's one of the reasons he was so intent on doing health care reform, because it was his, and instead of being a Bush problem that he has to deal with. And this is a Bush problem. It, it, it's a result of deregulation. If the people, in the, if the regulators in the management, mi minerals management service office in Denver had not been literally, not figuratively, literally sleeping with the people they were supposed to be regulating, <laughs> then maybe this wouldn't have happened, right? So he's, you know, he's like, he, privately, he's like really pissed off about this. But he, um, he tries to strip emotion out of his job, his, his decision making. Because he thinks that his batting average on decisions will be higher if he maintains that sense of detachment that so many people notice about him. And, and he thinks he can analyze in a more dispassionate, rational way. His problem is he forgets to inject emotion back into the public parts of the job where it's the only thing that truly can help him to connect. So calibrating this detachment is one of the great challenges that he, he faces so that he, he does stay above the fray but not so far above it that he looks arrogant and out of touch. And, and I think he struggled with that balance uh, all year long last year. And in some ways, he failed to connect uh, to the American public the way he needed to. But in the meantime, he got a lot of things done. How, how aware are they of this, this, this issue, this problem? And how would you say they're going about it in real time right now to deal with this, uh, the detachment issue? The being too cool. What I heard this past week is that, you know, his view was kind of philosophical. It's our time in the barrel. You know, this is going to happen. I'm going to have my ups and downs. I had my ups and downs in the campaign. And, and he, 
uh, he's aware of it. He's an enormously self-aware individual. He's one of the most, and you can tell this from reading his books, he's one of the most, he has to be the most self-aware man to hold the office in, you know, that I can think of. I mean, I, I, I think in some ways Kennedy was also yeah. quite self-aware, and Kennedy described himself to Jackie, uh, you know, Ben will know this better than I do, as an idealist without illusions, and I think that's, I think that's Obama's notion of himself. Um, so he's, he's always, his friend Marty Nesbitt describes the Rubik's Cube in his brain. He's always trying to think ahead, you know, and so this, this calibration of his detachment is something that he's definitely thought a lot about, but he, he tries to take the long view, and for him the long view comes out of Mayor Daley's, old man Daley's famous maxim, which Obama was not a member of the Daley machine, but you know, he knows about this and Axelrod and I talked about it and he's clearly talked to Obama about it, which is good government is good politics. So he honestly believes that if he delivers the way a, a ward boss in Chicago might, you know, or a mayor might deliver and, and improves people's lives, uh, that the politics eventually will take care of itself. And so he, he said, at one point he said, I don't get all wee-weed up about cable news. You know, he's trying to stay detached from the every day. And they, they complain all the time inside. Axelrod says, you know, in Washington, every day is election day. And they think that's ridiculous. And they think election day is election day. Not that, the, that all, being judged every day is silly and they shouldn't get too caught up in it. But their problem is that if they get too far away from that cable culture, then they're not communicating effectively. And so they, they're, they're caught in trying to strike that balance and I'm not sure they've done it as ably as, as they need to. The, 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 the optics of the job. When Obama said on the Today Show yesterday, the day before, that this is not theater, he was 100% wrong. Uh, the presidency it has always been a theater. And if you can't uh, operate in the theater of the presidency, you're not going to be effective. He, he seems uh, to have an aversion to bumper stickers. I mean, I, yeah. I, I read one. I didn't even re realize yeah. he, he had this idea that he's setting a new foundation. I don't even remember hearing that. That's not much of a bumper sticker. <laughs> uh, that was from the Georgetown speech, uh, New Foundation. And um, he reacted the same way Jimmy Carter did. In one of Jimmy Carter's inaugural uh, State of the Union addresses, he said, we need a new foundation for America. Same line. And um, it was bannered in the next day's New York Times. Does anybody remember New uh, Foundation? Carter calls for New Foundation. Rick Hertzberg is the only one who remembers it because he wrote it, right? So then what happened was everybody's, for, for a day, everybody's talking New Foundation. And at a press conference, he's at, Carter is asked, so is this the slogan for your administration? And his answer, if you can believe it, in 1977 or 78 was, uh, that's something my speechwriters came up with. <laughs> so that was the end of the new foundation. And for Obama, he he just he, like Clinton, he's bored by rep uh, repetition. So he repeated new foundation, you know, three or four times. It didn't seem to stick, and now he doesn't use it anymore. So is there is Axelrod at least sensitive to this, and are they trying to get him to come up with some bumper stickers, or do they do even his? His, his media advisors resist this notion of bumper stickers. No, they wanted the new foundation to be a bumper sticker, and it just didn't work. So they, they are in search of this um, to some extent, but they know that the boss is allergic to sound bites. He just hates them. He thinks sound bites and talking points, he considers those insults. Like he would sometimes even say, why won't that guy get off his talking points? So he, he's, he's just... And, and I think that this is a problem for him because what was a house divided against itself cannot stand? Right. Abraham Lincoln, soundbite. Right. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Soundbite. So somehow Obama, because he thinks like Mario Cuomo that you uh, campaign in poetry and govern in prose, he thinks, okay, now I'm in my prose phase, so I don't have to come up with... Uh, 
these sound bites. I don't have to pander to the stupid media culture with these sound bites, and it's hurting him. And I do think he'll adjust because ultimately he's not, you know, uh, a stubborn uh, that stubborn of an individual. He will adjust uh, in the way Bill Clinton adjusted. He didn't like sound bites initially either. He's a pretty stubborn guy. I mean, well, one of his this is a positive thing. His persistence is one of his persistence. Things. He's an extremely. He, he describes his philosophy. He said, I believe in a philosophy of persistence. That's as close as you can get to a real ideology for him. I, I, I think he can be defensive and stubborn, but he's also very politically pragmatic. And if, he, if he's convinced that he needs, uh, so he did. He said, I want to kick some ass. You know, he, uh, on the Today Show, he, he's going for the sound bites now a little bit because he knows he needs to. He is, though, a way of showing his contempt. I mean, there was a, even at the wrong moment, so you had a line in there, I've forgotten about this, that when they were supposed to be castigating the bonuses of the financial guys, he says over, he said, I'm all choked up with anger over here. I mean, yeah. he, you know, he can't help but be a little sarcastic about yeah, his, yeah. his own, his own yeah. emotional. Yeah, uh, well, that was when he got a frog in his throat at an early uh, <clears throat> press conference, and, it, you know, he said, I'm all choked up with anger here, and everybody laughed because they knew he wasn't. You know, mm -hmm. and that, and I, uh, Paul Volcker told me, um, and Paul Volcker in my book comes across as the populist, which to me was just an amazing, you know, sign of the times. But he said, sometimes I feel like shaking the presidents. Just get excited about this, you know. Um, There's, on, on a, one of the things, I, another sort of tension or struggle I see is, is that Obama is extremely irrational. He has that lawyer's ability to marshal a rational argument, right. to, to walk it down. On the other hand, he does at times have a tragic view of history. He reads Ronald Niebuhr, and he has some you know, humanity about the whole thing. But talk to us about that tension a little bit. I'm most fearful when people are entirely logical and rational, because life isn't. Uh, I mean, does he go too far in that direction, do you think? Or do, is he aware enough of the tragic side of life that, that he can guard against that? Um, you know, he's a writer, and I think that he, um, I think he has a sense uh, um, of the folly of human wishes. Um, you know, his favorite quote is that, uh, it's from King, and you know, it's the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So he knows that um, things are not always going to go Right, and I think he's pretty philosophical about that. I got very interested in the way his mind works, not just his temperament, but the way his brain well, talk to us is about set that. up. And I have a chapter called The Unbubba, where I compare his brain to Bill Clinton's brain. <laughs> and, and, you know, I thought the Bush comparison was not very interesting. <laughs> it's just too easy. Right? <laughs> but both Clinton and Obama have these big brains, but they work in really different well, ways. Let's talk to and, about, talk okay, about so that. So Clinton is uh, an inductive thinker. And actually, Larry Summers, who's not thrilled with the book, uh, but he, he was the one who was w one of the people who was explaining this to me. And I talked to a lot of people who, talked to who worked for both Clinton and Obama. And, and Bill Clinton is an inductive thinker. And I can really relate to that, because I think I'm an inductive thinker, too. And to me, it's a bit of a euphemism for being a disorganized thinker, right? <laughs> you know, and, uh, but Clinton is a inductive, horizontal thinker. And he's brilliant at making these connections between seemingly disparate issues. He has a kind of a synthetic, connective intelligence. Um, but it also makes him very indecisive. And he was called by the people who worked for him the second guesser in chief. Because they'd have these, you know, especially in the first term, they'd have these, you know, eight hour meetings. And the stakes were so much lower. Uh, they would, you know, the stimulus that, that Clinton tried to get through was $16 billion instead of $787 billion, And they failed. And they would be, there would always be, in the, the Obama conversations would always have a couple more zeros on the numbers than the Clinton conversations. And the Clinton conversations were way longer because he had this kind of musing, ruminative intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. It gave him more creativity in policy making because he could think of these unusual connections um, and, and, you know, and synthesize. Obama is a deductive thinker, and Hillary is as well. 
a vertical deductive thinker. And he drills down into a problem in a very disciplined, crisp, logical way. And he goes through these logic trees uh, or on, uh, when they're deciding uh, which Al-Qaeda target to whack, he goes through what are called the threat charts. And the president's daily briefing has been replaced by something they call the national security session. And it's, a, again, a very methodical process. And I thought that his deliberations on Afghanistan, the 20 hours in the Situation Room, which I, I deal with in considerable detail, was a, a really superb, whatever one thinks of the result or the final decision or whether it works or not, as a process, it was a superbly effective and properly managed decision-making process because he's so organized and disciplined in the way he, he, he uh, attacks a problem and so rational. Uh, it's, really, it's really quite impressive. And it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 <laughs> that they have had uh, anywhere close to this amount of deliberation on um, a national security issue. You know, Tom Donilon, who the last time I was here, I came over with him and he did a session uh, in this room uh, last year. He actually made a study and found that in neither Vietnam nor Iraq, and this was something that Robert McNamara told me for a column in 2005, in neither, 2003, neither case, did they actually have a discussion about going to war. <clears throat> I mean, it's mind-blowing. They, they went an inch by inch in both Vietnam and in Iraq without actually, as McNamara put it, raising the critical issues for debate. So Obama, when I interviewed him, he said, I was absolutely determined that I was going to slow everything down and we were going to challenge and question every assumption. So he, with the help of his bad cop, Joe Biden, asked question after question after question about Afghanistan. And it, it really is the best illustration we have of the way his mind works. I, I, I was impressed by the description of that. But at the end, uh, they do give uh, uh, the military 40,000 troops. And, and then they say, well, we're going to start getting them out in 2011. The one part, and let me ask you about this. What makes Obama so sure, talk about assumptions, that he's going to be able to get the troops out starting in 20, 2011? I'm not sure he is sure. He, you know, he gave um, Gates, who's the most influential member of the cabinet, this loophole, you know, conditions on the ground permitting. Um, but I think he's very determined to do it for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is... Um, political. Uh, I think he wants to be able to run in 2012 um, as somebody who, in the same way as getting out of Iraq, is at least beginning to get out of Afghanistan. And the second is budgetary. You know, he had Peter Orzag, his budget director, in the situation room. Maybe you know of a precedent, but where the, the head of OMB is in the situation room, and it's because the Pentagon... Dick Darman always wanted to be there. He wanted, right? That's good. <laughs> Yeah, so the, but they were so disgusted with the Pentagon budget numbers that they were getting. And Obama, when he gave his speech at West Point, which was coincidentally the day after I interviewed him on, on this, uh, he, he talked about the costs and the price. And normally when you're giving a speech about war, cost and price refers to the cost in human lives. And for him, it was uh, at least partly also a, a, a budget issue. He, he simply doesn't believe that we can afford as a country, given the deficit, to, have, to spend another trillion dollars in Afghanistan. So that, that helps motivate him. And also, the main reason why he's very determined to get out is he said very, very explicitly, and he's learned to be very explicit with the military and actually say, and that's an order. He, he actually says that. Yeah. Uh, and, and he pinned them down, can you complete this mission uh, quickly enough in retraining the Afghan forces so that we can begin at least to withdraw in 2011. And they repeatedly told him yes. And so he said, and I don't want this to mean, I don't want you to come back and say, because you're telling me now that you can do this. So if they come back and say, no, well, we couldn't do it, then it's on their head. Then it's, well, why not? Then it's, well, maybe the people in the room who were arguing the troops actually hurt because they seem like an occupying power. 
maybe they were right, which is another reason to start getting out in 2011. So I think he's very, you know, he said to me at one point, look, the Pentagon always wants more troops. So he's, uh, uh, tell me a war where they haven't wanted more troops. So he's wise to the fact that they're, they're always going to want more resources. They felt rightly that they had been under-resourced in the Iraq war. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, I mean, Joe Biden came back from the door. He said, we're getting out, going to get out in 2011, July 2011, we're going to start getting out, bet on it. And then he, he's late for lunch with the president. He goes to the door of his office, and in his sort of Labrador way, he, you know, comes back to me. I'm still uh, standing there, you know, with my tongue out, you know, and, <laughs> you know, uh, with the, uh, Jay Carney, his, you know, his uh, communications guy. He, he comes kind of running back from the door, and he puts his finger in my chest and says, bet on it. Yeah. Uh, now, my, maybe Biden's wrong, but I think there's a, a better chance than the conventional wisdom suggests that they actually will start getting out. There's a dramatic scene uh, in the book of him standing up to the Pentagon. Why don't you, I'm going to turn to questions in a minute, but before I do, tell a little bit about Mullen and how he dealt with all that. Well, you remember that um, there was a period in... September and October of last year where they were having, you know, it, it wasn't a secret that they were meeting in the Situation Room. They were having these long discussions. And you might remember seeing General McChrystal on 60 Minutes. He was on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. He was in Newsweek. You did a story uh, about, you know, his views. He was expressing himself before they had determined what the policy was, right? So, you know, the White House made its displeasure known, and then uh, somehow he didn't quite get the memo, right? So he goes to London, and get, McChrystal does, and he gives a speech, and in the Q&A afterward, he's asked, uh, can you support a, what they call a counterterrorism as opposed to a counterinsurgency plan, which is the Biden plan, and that is very few troops use predator drones to attack al-Qaeda targets, and a very, very, very different idea than a full, open-ended counterinsurgency plan. And he says, uh, in a word, no. And so in Washington, they're going, wait a minute, in the White House, they're going, let me get this straight. The commanding general is saying that if the president sides with the vice president, he cannot support the policy. And there's a word for that. It's insubordination. Uh, and uh, so that wasn't Obama's word, but there were some other people who were willing to use that word. And um, Obama is livid about this. And first, he's in Copenhagen to try to get the Olympics, fail to get the Olympics for Chicago. Uh, he had to go back when he almost didn't go for the climate change conference. You know they. They said, what, you'll go, to you'll go to Copenhagen to get the Olympics, but you won't go there to save the planet. So he had to go back to Copenhagen. But this was on his first trip to Copenhagen. And, and McChrystal's still in London. He summons him over. And on the, there's a picture of them having a one-on-one -on, -one on, on Air Force One on, when it's on the tarmac in Copenhagen. And in that meeting, Obama kind of decided, look, McChrystal's in over his head. He doesn't really know how to deal with the press. This is at a higher pay grade. And I like McChrystal. He's good, you know, gung-ho commander. And um, so he gets back to Washington, and he summons Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, to the Oval Office with, uh, with uh, Gates in attendance. And he says, quote, I am exceedingly unhappy with your conduct. I want to know, quote, here and now that this conduct will change. And it is doing a major disservice to our men and, human, and women in uniform and to our country. And um, it was described to me as the most direct confrontation with the military since Truman fired MacArthur in 1951. I, I found that hard to believe, so I started researching it, and, and it actually is true. Now, Biden wanted somebody fired over this, because he was, if, if Obama was mad, he was twice as mad. Uh, and Obama decided not to fire anybody because they had just fired General McKiernan a few months earlier. Um, but afterward, a couple days later, uh, Gates went out. He gave a speech to the Association of U U.S. Army. He said that generals' advice to the commander-in-chief should be in <laughs> private. They should not 
try to advance their views uh, during the policymaking process in public. And uh, Mullen described himself as chagrined after the meeting. Um, they claimed the whole thing was a big misunderstanding, that they had not been trying to uh, manipulate or box in or jam the president. When I asked him about it, I said, were you jammed by the Pentagon? And he said, quote, I neither confirm nor deny that I was jammed <laughs> by the Pentagon. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, OK, let's take some uh, questions. Uh, who wants to go first? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, John. Oh, excuse hey, me. John. Yeah, you should take your. This is uh, uh, oh, Jonathan Rausch, yeah. one, you know, one of our um, ridiculously talented colleagues. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Well, I'll just end there because it can only go down. <laughs> so uh, I was um, uh, over the weekend had occasion to hear a U.S. senator and a very smart one talk about presidential leadership, and he was reflecting that the presidents judged most successful by history are neither inductive reasoners nor deductive reasoners, they're instinctive, thus Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Reagan, that the guys who try to think their way through fail because if you can decide the question on the merits using raw intelligence, um, it doesn't reach the president. Smart people down the chain will figure yeah. that out. What really counts on the top is, is uh, good instinct in impossible, uh, over impossible questions. Could you just reflect on that? Um, I think it's a good point. The problem, and Roosevelt was an instinctive leader, you know, when uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes just famously described Roosevelt as second-class intellect, first-class temperament, and Obama has a first-class intellect, and we don't quite know about his public temperament, as we discussed. But the problem with instinct is Bush. So. Presidents are always overcorrecting for their predecessors. And Bush was a total gut player. Everything was based on instinct. And so it's natural and maybe harmful that his successor is going to kind of go over to the other extreme and try to apply as much um, you know, intelligence and logic as he can. I think it's a real weakness. Um, I, I, you know, one of the weaknesses I point to in Obama is his over-reliance on what I call policy mandarins. These are these, you know, like a lot of policy mandarins in the room right now, you know. <laughs> you know, very highly educated people with a lot of experience in government, but as, you know, as Lyndon Johnson said at one point, I wish one of them had just run for sheriff, you know. <laughs> and, 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 or, you know, in Obama's case, or, you know, or met a payroll. There are not enough guys around him who've met a payroll. So, um, like, I was interested to learn that uh, a very smart guy named uh, Ken Baer, who is the um, communications director for OMB, um, he's an Oxford PhD. I mean, this is the guy who's doing the press for OMB. And uh, Ron Klain, who's Biden's chief of staff, said that. Um, you know, he only went to Georgetown and Harvard Law, and he felt inadequate that he hadn't gone to Harvard and Harvard Law in that environment. And he was only half kidding, right? So they're, they're trying to, just to sort of address your question, to apply as much intelligence as they can. And they're maybe, they're not oblivious to the best and the brightest problem, but they have maybe overcompensated for the fact that Bush hired his people based on ideological purity, and he hired a bunch of second raters uh, who were not well educated and didn't really know a lot. There were some smart people, but not nearly as many. Uh, and you know, it it hurt Bush. So they think that intelligence can improve their batting average; that it's not going to lead to the right result in every case, but but improve it. In the really tough decisions, there is some sense of instinct that comes into play. And I think it's just too early to know whether Obama has the right instincts or not. It's Valerie Jarrett and David Axelrod's job, in part, to get him in touch with the instincts that made him president in the first place and to kind of reconnect him when necessary to, uh, to that instinctive person. <clears throat> Eileen. Hi. Um, Eileen Shields-West. I have a question about uh, press conferences. 
Um, it seems the administration has an aversion to press conferences, and I don't understand why he's good on his feet. I think it would help in a situation like this. Um, I just, you know, can you explain why that, um, that mentality? I think it's beyond stupid. They, they went 10 months without a, a press conference. It was, it was nuts. And, and uh, you know, they had a bunch of them in the first half of 2009. And so I didn't, it wasn't until I was close to the end of writing my book and I kept expecting that they would have one and I wouldn't, you know. And so I don't fully know the answer. I know that what they say is, look, he's held three times as many one-on-one -on -one interviews as Bush did. I think he held 153 in his uh, first year. And so they say, what are you talking about? He's not accessible. He's, and, he, and then the other thing, they get defensive and they say, Wait a minute. The same people who are complaining about him not having a press conference the same, are the people who say he's overexposed. He's in our face all the time, you know. But I, I think what it is is that he, um, and as I said, I think it's just stupid because the folks, a lot of the folks in the press room are not getting another chance to have one-on-ones. Uh, they work for smaller news organizations, or, and um, why alienate them? It's just silly. I mean, my feeling about this, which I also you know, wrote about when Clinton was president is is simple. Dinosaurs bite. Mm -hmm. You know, we we might be, you know, dinosaurs in the the old White House press corps in this blog world, but we can still take a bite out of the president's hide. And so why alienate them? So I do think it's silly, but when they get defensive, what they say is um, you know, we're we're communicating in all kinds of other ways and we've got tweets and interviews and and it's quite interesting the way they're communicating abroad and that the, the old-fashioned press conference is doing it on their terms and he's very very resistant to operating on somebody else's timetable he actually said to Chuck Todd in one of his early press conferences when when Todd was giving him a hard time about not reacting faster to the Iranian demonstrations he said look that's your timetable that's not mine I'm not on the 24-hour cable cycle that all you operate on. You know, I'm, I've got my own timetable for the way I think it's in the national interest to react. And I think that reflected his, his basic uh, contempt for, um, for us. And that contempt is dangerous for him uh, over time. Um, and I also think it's an emotional, for an unemotional guy, it's an emotional reaction. Um, the, during the health care debate, he would say to liberals, to single-payer liberals or public option liberals who came in and complained to him, and, and it, Rahm Emanuel would say the same thing, look, you, go, you, you guys don't get it. You have to deal with the world as it is, not as you want it to be. And the world as it is, we don't have the votes for a public option, you know. And, but Obama didn't take his own advice when it came to the media. He's got to deal with the silly media world as it is, um, not as he necessarily wants it to be. My name is John Quinn. I'm interested in the observation that Secretary Gates is the most influential cabinet member. Could you give us some insight into why you think that is the case and compare or contrast the president's relationship with the Secretary of State? Um, well, first of all, I don't think uh, Hillary Clinton is uninfluential. I mean, she has a good, strong working relationship with the president. Uh, it's surprisingly unfraught. Their staffs are at each other's throats, but uh, you know, they, they get along well. And, and when, when his people didn't want him to pick her, and I have a whole chapter on this, you know, he said, look, Guys, he always said, look, guys, she's the most qualified, okay, you know. And then one of the old Clinton people said, well, you know, I think she's, uh, you know, gotten past a lot of the bad feeling. He says, don't kid yourself, she hasn't, she hasn't gotten past it. She still has these feelings, but it's okay, because she's so good that I want her, you know. So he respects her advice, but Gates is, has the institutional memory. Um, he gives him political cover because <clears throat> if he can get Gates to sign on to anything, he knows that he won't have problems with the Congress. Um, he gives him the bipartisanship 
<clears throat> team of rivals thing that he, he really wants. Uh, and also, he just has found that he has very solid judgment. Uh, they sometimes call him Yoda in the White House. Um, and, and he was very determined that he not, not leave, and he got Gates to agree to stay on, on for longer. Sir. Hi, my name is Patrick Mendes. You spoke about uh, deductive thinking and reasoning. If you were to look at uh, the key people around him, uh, military leaders in Afghanistan to you know, NSC and also the NSA, now they are nominating the new person. Uh, it makes sense to see that deductive thinking, you know, very, very clear, right and wrong, straight line thinkers in the military world. In a crisis like in the Middle East right now, everything is driven by emotions. Uh, if you were in the Middle East, you can see that. How do you think he's going to wrestle with this one in the mindset that you describe in the book and the outside world that driven by emotions, uh, that uh, other side of the brain? Um, well, uh, he described, when I talked to him about foreign policy, uh, he described in his super self-confident way, and he manages to be self-confident without being arrogant, which is a very, as John Podesta said, a very strange combination. Um, but he described most of his foreign policy as flawless, except on the Middle East, which he described as a failure. And That's a big except. Yeah, it's a big except. But, um, you know, he was talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. but. You know, uh, he was very uh, proud of the fact that they essentially, and he didn't put it this way, but that they drove a stake between Russia and Iran. And uh, that that was extremely important to get Russia and China to join with the United States in isolating Iran. And they, they think they've been successful at that. Um, uh, you know, uh, George Mitchell has is, is, is working on this. Um, they've made some of the mistakes in the way they've, uh, I think the way they've handled Netanyahu. Um, I, I can't fully answer your question in part because um, I, I'm sort of trying to train myself not to speculate because, you know, it's, it's like trying to predict where the stock market's going to go, you know. And it might be that this flotilla business, instead of being a disaster and a huge setback, it might open up some new channels of communications and maybe something positive can come out of it. But we're asked, Evan and I uh, you know, are asked so often, like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And we don't know. We don't have a clue, right? I mean, it doesn't I mean, stop us from saying it. We said it. <laughs> but we don't have a clue. So this is why we, we're more interested in writing history, either you know, distant history or instant history. To, look at what has already happened and try to analyze that. And I guess there are some indications. I think that he doesn't want either himself or Hillary to end up the way Condi Rice did, where, you know, or, or Warren Christopher. Remember, he went to Syria, like, you know, literal dozens of times. And it, it, it just completely monopolized their efforts. And they want both of them to maintain a broader, more global view and not get hung up uh, until they get down to the short strokes. And so it's, it's really in George Mitchell's uh, lap right now. With Dennis Ross, who left the State Department to come over to uh, the NSC, uh, also having an important role, and you know Jim Jones and Tom Donnell and the other players. But um, I don't think it's going to have sustained presidential attention for a while, although he does have to repair his relationship with Netanyahu, which is going on right now. And and it's something that I found out after uh, I finished doing research for the book, which I'll put in the paperback and I'll tell you, but just to give you an example of uh, uh, how poisonous the feelings are. One thing I do have in is that Netanyahu thinks that Ram, Ram Israel Emanuel, which is his full name, you know, President Barack Hussein Obama and the Chief of Staff is Ram Israel Emanuel. Uh, Bibi thinks that Ram and David Axelrod, who's also Jewish, are, quote, self-hating Jews. Um, and which, in Ram's case in particular, is just ridiculous. But Ram, the way he does with everybody, 
just goes right up in their face. When Ron was a, a, in his 30s and working in the Clinton White House and Tony Blair was about to go on stage, he went up to the Prime Minister uh, uh, and he put his finger in his face, don't fuck it up. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Rom talks, to, Rom talks to Bibi that way too, right? And Bibi doesn't really appreciate it. But Bibi is so oversensitive, he's so oversensitive that, and this is what I found out that's not in the book, that uh, there was a picture of what, by the White House photographer of Obama with his feet up on the desk in the Oval Office, which was something that Abraham Lincoln liked to do. And I was never able to find out whether Obama likes to do it because he has long legs or was imitating Lincoln. But he does it all the time. He, and he wanders around the West Wing and he'll go into Axelrod. One time I was in Axelrod's office and he came in and did this. And he there, does it all the time. And he puts his feet up on their desk and starts talking. So there's a picture of him on the phone talking to Netanyahu with his feet up on the desk. Well, in the Middle East, as I think many of you know, if you show the soles of your feet, it's a huge insult, right? So Bibi got it into his head that Obama was intentionally insulting him. And he considered it to be this grievous insult. And he, he was raging, you know, in, in Jerusalem about how can the President of the United States do this to me? How could he insult me this way? And that gives you some idea of the you know, the hard feelings, uh, especially after the, the, the dispute over the settlements in, in East Jerusalem. Uh, Hi, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, speaking of how President Obama is working with the press, one of my concerns is that the media tends to love characters, obviously, in conflict. And the Tea Partiers and the extremes on both sides are that with exclamation marks all over the place. And so I'm concerned from the standpoint of what will happen to democracy going forward, frankly, that the media is giving them too much power, and empowering them, if you will. Sure, it's a good story, but it's not 24-7, and there are a lot of problems that we need to solve, i.e. the Aspen Institute is trying to bring people together to solve them too. So what role does the media have in all of this as well? Well, I think it's a good question. I agree with you that the Tea Party has gotten too much attention. I don't actually deal with it very much in my book. I mean, it's, it's in there, but, um, you know, it's, it's the same. I call it the, fear, the fearful fifth. We used to call them reactionaries. These are the people who wrote me and Evan and, and Ben, you know, on the red typewriter ribbons. They sent them to Senate offices too, you know, and now the red typewriter ribbon crowd the cranks, they have their own television network now, okay? <laughs> so part of it is just that, you know, as John Stewart said, what used to be talk radio is now a 24-hour uh, network. And so when 10,000 people come out, they treat it as a huge thing. In one case, Fox even put a uh, uh, footage of the Promise Keepers, the evangelical group that had hundreds of thousands, and they put the video up from that demonstration on the mall to as if it was the Tea Party uh, demonstration until they were caught at it, right? So 10,000 people come out. It's a huge story, Tea Party, Tea Party. A million people demonstrated recently in favor of immigration reform. Did anybody see it? A million. They had a, about a month ago, they had a million people in the streets. And, and uh, so I do think it's being grossly overcovered because, as you say, they're characters and it's a good story and it's a new name, Tea Party. And, uh, but I, I don't agree that it's some you know, great threat to democracy. And I think there's a, a lot of times a lot of hand-wringing about these kinds of things and that eventually the system sort of rebalances. I don't think they're going to do especially I don't think the Tea Party folks are going to do especially well this fall. The Republicans generally will do well, but I don't think the I think when we, the final score comes in, and this is speculation, who knows, I could be completely wrong, but I don't think that some of the more extreme candidates um, on the Republican side are going to do particularly well. Sir. Wait, wait for one sec, if you would. Who are some of his favorite foreign leaders? Interesting question. I, I was uh, very uh, determined to find that out. Um, he connects better to the younger ones who are not, you know, the biggest insult that Obama has is uh, stop relitigating that. 
He doesn't like to revisit old things that he thinks are settled unless there's some new evidence. So something like the um, Armenian, you know, the 1915 massacre, uh, Turkish massacre, which any president has to deal with, he just cannot believe these people are still hung up on this, right? And so he likes uh, younger leaders who have not um, uh, been caught up in the Cold War and a lot of the old arguments. Uh, so um, uh, he did not have a particularly good relationship with Gordon Brown for some reasons I explained. There was a lot of publicity about the strains with Angela Merkel, but um, they actually got along better than um, uh, the publicity suggested. When she first called to congratulate him after he'd been elected, uh, he called her Angela, and she said, no, it's Angela, like Angela Davis, <laughs> which, <coughs> which Obama thought was just hilariously funny because you know, she had studied Angela Davis growing up in Eastern Europe, in East Germany, and he had studied her when he was in college, you know. Um, so um, uh, I think he's, um, uh, he developed a pretty good relationship with, um, with Premier Wen, the, uh, Hu Jintao's uh, number two, also a decent, uh, but a, a, he had a little more to talk about with Wen. And I have a pretty funny story um, from the com climate change conference uh, um, about Wen, which I can tell if you have time. Um, yeah. Uh, you have time, you want to hear the Premier yeah. Wen story? <laughs> um, so some of you may have read that uh, the, the climate change conference in Copenhagen had, was a failure. It was fa uh, Hillary had been there for 11 days. They weren't getting anything done. And there were some very sketchy reports that Obama had crashed this meeting. But like everything else, and this is something that, that Evan and I have both found, because Evan's done these wonderful narratives. Uh, you know, these books that we do every uh, four years and then other narratives at which Evan is the master and as he knows better than I do, you can't find out what happened until it's out of the headlines, you know, until everybody's attention has moved somewhere else. Then if you circle back later, you can actually find out. So I didn't go to Copenhagen. There were about more than a thousand journalists credentialed. None of them could get the story of what happened in the room, but by circling back later, I could find out. So he uh, wants to meet with Premier Wen, who he's just seen in Beijing, to talk about a registry to salvage something out of the conference. So at least China will, for the first time, have elemental transparency, begin to at least record what their carbon emissions are uh, in an international registry. And uh, he finally gets, uh, you know, he says, I just want to, he gets real, kind of irritated, you know, just want to see Premier Wen. They hear that. Prime Minister Singh of India, who Obama, by the way, has great respect for uh, because of his contributions in modernizing the Indian economy years ago when he was finance minister, they, they hear that he's left for the airport. The conference is so, going so badly. And uh, so the advanced people go in to the meeting where they're supposed to have the bilateral with, with, with Wen. And they see that, no, Singh hasn't left for the airport. He's in there meeting with Wen of China, Lula of Brazil, and Zuma of South Africa. And so Obama says, hey, let's crash this sucker, you know. So he just, like, walks in to this meeting in this abandoned shopping mall in Copenhagen where the conference is taking place. And um, Wen has a an environmental and energy minister named Minister Xi. And Minister Xi sees the president walking in and he says, out, out, in some mixture of Chinese and English. <laughs> Obama just ignores that and he goes, hey, Lula, hey, you know, and no chairs here. Oh, okay, I'm going to sit my, my friend Lula. Yeah, what's going on? So he like pulls up a chair. <laughs> Hillary's with him and Mike, Mike Froman, no, it was actually, it wasn't Tom Donilon that I came here with the last time, it was Mike Froman. We came to the Aspen Institute with last year. And so he's got Mike Froman and Todd Stern, who some of you know, uh, who's the climate change point guy. And, um, and so the, those are the four Americans. And Froman, Stern, and Hillary start negotiating with their counterparts. And Obama's negotiating with his counterparts. 
And they go through about 90 minutes of negotiation, the aim of which is what they eventually got, this, this registry, uh, to salvage something out of the conference. And um, they're getting down to the short strokes, and suddenly Mr. Xi starts shrieking at Premier Wen. I mean, shrieking at him in Chinese. And uh, everybody looks at the interpreter, and then Wen says to the interpreter something in Chinese, and the interpreter says, for internal discussion only, <laughs> internal use only. And Obama, without missing a beat, slaps the table and says, I'll take that to mean we have an agreement. And he gets up and hikes out of the room. <laughs> and I thought that was, talk about instinct, I thought that was pretty good instinct. And then the Chinese had to live with what they had agreed to. That's great. Sorry. Uh, well, hang on one sec for the mic. Alan Wurzel, I'd like to ask about the <coughs> way Obama orchestrated the health care debate. Yeah. Some people think he overlearned Hillary's lesson, and as a result, the debate was more protracted and more adversarial than might otherwise have been the case. I'd be interested in well, I, I have an awful lot about that, uh, two chapters. Um, uh, I don't think that that critique is right. They made some mistakes, obviously. The biggest mistake was they didn't, they didn't sh uh, lean on uh, Max Baucus in the early summer, late spring of 2009. And as one of his top people said, the president needed to just say to him, Max, it's over. You just, you, you have to move the bill and you have to move it now. And because they were on a timetable and uh, uh, they, they knew that the longer it went on, the harder it was gonna be politically. And they, the timetable was get it to the floor, you know, out of committee, to the floor by the August recess. And when they missed that deadline, a lot of bad things happened. Now, Baucus isn't entirely to blame. He got it out of his committee by October 13th, and it didn't pass the Senate until Christmas Eve. So there was a lot of blame to go around. And it's, to me, I kind of got into it, uh, into the, the details of it, because I did think it was so historic. Um, but the critics want to say that Obama should have gone to the floor with his own proposal rather than leaving it to Congress. And, uh, well, he never did go to his, uh, he didn't have his own proposal until, uh, formally, until they got to conference committee right before the Massachusetts debacle. But, uh, and as a contingency, Rahm Emanuel, after sa he told me, I begged the president not to do this, so he was against doing it, as would Biden, Christina Romer, Rahm, uh, David Axelrod, they all thought, Obama shouldn't do it in 2009. That was a political mistake, too much freight on the train. But as a contingency, when they were working hard to make it happen after Obama decided to do it, they drafted in secret their own 800-page bill inside the White House over, over last summer, which also hadn't, didn't come out at the time. Uh, so they had, a, they, had a, they had a contingency plan. So the question that I think is implicit in what you're asking, why didn't they bring that to the floor? And the answer is that the egos of the moderate Democrats on the Senate Finance Committee wouldn't have stood for it, and they would have gone against the bill. And we saw what happened with, with Lieberman, you know, multiply that by, you know, five or six, and you don't have a bill. So if Obama understood, as the Clintons did not, that you have to, if you want to actually get it done and not just talk about getting it done, and they got it done after 75 years. I mean, I have in my Roosevelt book that, Roosevelt was talking about this, right? If you want to get it done, you have to give Congress ownership. You just have to. It's just the practical reality of it. And you have to, you know, hold back, talk to them endlessly in private as he was doing, but let them get, you know, some of the glory for moving the bill forward. Uh, and there are a lot more complexities to, to that, but I don't, the short answer is I do not think that they overlearned the, the Clinton lesson. Back there, ma'am. Uh, Hi, I'm Linda Killian from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I just wanted to press you a little bit on your assessment that Obama is not arrogant. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of, if he has an Achilles heel, I think that's probably it. Um, and that the sort of acolytes that surround him, you know, are more in the nature of worshipers than they are, yeah. you know. And, and so I think there's a sort of, we know the truth, 
we know the right way, and, and I, I think that's a bit of a problem for them, and I think that's reflected in his attitude toward the press, which, and I, both of you correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of another presidential candidate that the press loved as much as they loved Obama since John F. Kennedy. And for him to think the press doesn't give him a fair shake is kind of crazy, I think. So well, yeah. I, I'm, I'm interested in your reaction to that. Yeah. I, well, for, I don't disagree with you, and I, I deal in the book. I say that the people around him like him, love him too much, and I think that's a real, a real problem. It can, it can really uh, hurt any leader in any organization, because what happens is he says that he wants people to stand up to him, <coughs> and he says that he doesn't want yes men, but he gets them because they like him too much, and it's a problem. And his, obviously he has an ego, uh, he's extraordinarily self-confident, but it's, just, it's a sort of an odd thing. He's very intense and very relaxed at the same time, like only certain high-performance athletes are maybe. And so when you're around him, you don't get that arrogant vibe. You know, I mean, we all know arrogant people, you just don't get it. But where I think you're right is that, um, writ large, it can be arrogant. And I, I agree with you that his attitude toward the White House press corps is, is arrogant. Sometimes he'll say something that seems really arrogant, and he manages to get away with it because, like a lot of successful people, you're not quite sure how much he's kidding. So uh, at one point during the campaign, uh, he gave a speech, and when he came back, uh, uh, you know, Pete Rouse, who's um, one of his four top aides, he was his chief of staff in the Senate, and he's one of the people I try to introduce to the public because he's not well as, as well known as the others. And he and Robert Gibbs uh, say, so how did it go? And Obama says, well, some people thought it was excellent, and no, some people thought it was just good, I thought it was excellent, or something like that. You know, and if you just sort of saw that in cold print, you go, my God, that's an arrogant thing to say. But he's sort of saying it with a little bit of a twinkle in his, in his eye, uh, and and so that, that, it may be that he turns out to be arrogant, but um, it's not a, uh, if it is, it's a subtle and in some ways more fascinating. Does, any, does anybody ever tell him that arrogant. he's showing too much contempt? To the, anybody ever dare to t say that to him? It's a good question. I don't really know the answer to that. I know that they did not, that nobody had the balls to tell him that the biggest problem, that, that, that the biggest problems problem with leaks is not the leaks themselves, but managing the president's reaction to leaks, and that getting really angry about leaks, which Obama, like most presidents, does, uh, and I have a lot of stories about that, uh, is a colossal waste of time. And, you know, you, you, you just kind of wanted one of these guys to say to him, this is just silly. But instead, they channel his anger on that. and and express it to other people in the staff. I don't think that Rahm Emanuel, who scrolls through his Blackberry when the president's talking in the Oval Office, has any you know, compunction about telling him when he thinks he's off base. And that's one of the things where he, for all the criticism of him, where he provides a, a, a real you know, value. And I do think Valerie Jarrett and David Axelrod, because they've known him for a long time, and Pete Rouse, I think they all can tell him when they think he's, he's wrong. But when it's a personal thing, it's a, no matter what the work situation is, it, it can be harder, and I, I just don't know the answer whether, you know, Valerie Jarrett really puts it to him on yeah. certain things. Yeah. In the back of the room there, ma'am. Michelle wonder. does, by the way. I'll bet she Michelle does. gives him a piece of her mind. I bet. All, all the time. And I, I love what she said. Uh, um, she said, when asked about his childhood, she said that Barack spent so much time alone when he was a child that sometimes I think he was raised by wolves. <laughs> uh, Paula Gordon, I uh, have gordonhomeland.com, uh, and a, a writer and educator. Um, I wonder why uh, you think he hasn't placed more attention on jobs. Is it because he doesn't have an answer? It seems that all of the things that he's trying to do are, are diversionary, um, and uh, that it really should be the central one. 
second part of that is, do you think that that issue might be um, so great at the time of uh, uh, when 2012 comes around that he might decide not to run or not, may not have the option of running? I mean, be defeated or decide not to run? Uh, well, what do you see as a possible scenario for, for his uh, not running or for his not being able to run because of uh, Well, I do think that if running. unemployment were to go up, he, he won't get reelected. And he knows that you know, if it goes up you know, 12 percent, 13 percent or whatever, uh, if we have a double dip recession, he's, he's a one term president. You know, I asked him, do you think you're going to get reelected? And he said that it was too soon to tell. And I think he was right about that. He said to one of his good friends uh, from law school, he said, um, I guess I'm going to have to run again uh, because, uh, you know, I don't want to leave to Mitt Romney uh, all the good things that we've done after we've been through all this crap. And that's, that's his basic kind of attitude. So he's going to run again. Um, but on the jobs thing, which I did, I did discuss with him, um, you know, his view, I think they made a mistake in not having direct hiring like Roosevelt, you know, WPA kind of thing. I think that they would have had more. I also think they made a big mistake not using their leverage over the banks early in 2008 when they had it, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but uh, they decided that they were not going to do direct hiring for a lot of complex reasons. Uh, and so they were going to use the stimulus to um, create jobs. And the, the newest, just last week, the CBO estimates were that it, the stimulus has created, and these were independently assessed as well, between 2.5 and 3.5 million jobs. It's very hard to get a more specific uh, figure. But I asked him, I said, why didn't you pivot to jobs, jobs, jobs? And um, he said that he thought to do that in the middle of 2009 would be to create unrealistic short-term expectations, and expectations are already a big problem for him, because the stimulus, because as he said, you know, shovel-ready projects is, a, is a, the biggest lie in government. There's, you know, there are no shovel-ready projects. And it was a long process to get the jobs into the pipeline. So he didn't want to have the conversation be too much about jobs when they couldn't deliver them yet. Um, and so now, with the jobs beginning to come online, remember, at the time Obama became president, and this to me is the most interesting of all the statistics that I, I came across. When Obama became president in January of 2009, the American economy was losing 740,000 jobs a month. Now, now that you know people's portfolios have come back and some time has passed, people forget. If we had stayed on that pace, by the end of 2009, we would have been in another Great Depression. No exaggeration. Another Great Depression. And so he says the whole thing was like a, that his political problem is that their successes have been what he calls a counterfactual that unemployment didn't go to 20 percent, and it's much harder to get credit for that than it was for Roosevelt to get credit for bringing it down from 20 percent to, to 12 percent. Uh, and, and so, you know, they feel like they have helped to create uh, a lot of new jobs. Um, and, but moving forward, there's this tension between job creation and deficit reduction, which is becoming kind of the, one of the central dynamics and fissures in the administration with different aides, and I, you know, I could tell you which ones if you want on sort of different sides of the argument in terms of what should be emphasized. But I think you're exactly right that, in, to use the buzzword of the, the day, that the optics were wrong for a lot of 2009 and should have been more on jobs. And that was another consequence of not getting health care through faster, because the whole idea was, We'll get this done by fall, and then we'll pivot to jobs when the jobs are starting to come in. And instead, they were arguing about it till March of this year. And they lost a lot of time where they wanted the discussion to be on jobs. Then, then this spring, OK, finally, we're going to be able to talk about jobs. And the oil spill hits. Let me, I'm going to ask you a, a last question here, related question. Uh, does Obama have the 
political guts, the inspirational ability to ask the country to do something that's really hard, to, to make a sacrifice? Um, I, think he, I think he definitely does because he, um, he wants to do big things. And one of his good friends said, look, the, the nightmare for him is that he's in his 50s and 60s and, and says, I, you know, I could have done this and I didn't. I had my chance and I didn't do it. So at one point he says to his staff, he says, I wasn't sent here to do school uniforms, you know, which was a little bit of a shot at Bill Clinton. But that, that's really what he feels like. So if he thinks that doing one of these big things requires sacrifice, he'll do it. But he, he's not, uh, he doesn't want to just, you know, fall on his sword and go to the, he hasn't, he has yet to hold an Oval Office speech to the country. And, uh, you know, he, he knows he can't go back over and over again and ask for sacrifice over and over again. He is conscious of the Jimmy Carter experience, but if there comes a point where they're at a real kind of crossroads and he has to ask the American people to do it, I think he will um, because he really is, um, he, he's playing a longer game and I, I think that for all the criticism of him, and there's probably more in my book than maybe I've indicated today, you know, he's not, um, we were talking earlier about the Washington Monthly, which is the magazine that I came out of before I went to Newsweek, and Charlie Peters, the, the founder, you know, it probably wasn't his distinction, but he always divided everybody into two categories, the people who wanted to be something and the people who wanted to do something. And Obama, you think of him as a man of words, and you know McCain tried to go after him. Oh, it's all just fancy speeches. Yeah, he's got a nice. Well, the, you know, the really interesting thing to me about him is that he really does want to do things, and not just get there and just be president and be. And if he's only remembered as being the first African American president, he will be a deeply disappointed man in retirement. Thanks, Sean. Let me, can I just thank, thank both of you, of Evan, Jonathan, for, for coming, and thank Alma again for sponsoring the series. And also, Rachel Summers, this is her last, uh, her last series today, the luncheon, so we thank you, Rachel, for all your, all your work on this. And as Walter would say if he were here, buy books. We love to sell books. Okay. Thank you.